I think it goes without saying that the Samsung Galaxy S21 is probably the most underrated and undesirable flagship smartphone from Samsung that we've seen in the last couple years. Its bigger brothers, the Galaxy S21 Plus and the S21 Ultra, have definitely gotten a lot more attention. I mean, have you seen this phone? <laughs> it's pretty amazing with an incredible camera system on the back and performance that's honestly off the charts. But what if I told you that the Galaxy S21 is the phone you should actually be buying? I'm Nick Gray, and this is my review of the Samsung Galaxy S21. Now, before you just jump into the comments and tell me that the Galaxy S21 is a poor excuse for a flagship smartphone or that Samsung has really lost its way over the years, hear me out just a minute. Flagship smartphones have undergone this weird transformation over the last two to three years with companies like Samsung, Huawei, and even Apple splitting their devices in their flagship tier into separate categories where we used to just have a small and a large phone. Now we have ultras and pros as well. If you want the cutting edge camera technology with a 10X periscope camera, or 12 or even 16 gigabytes of RAM and all the other bells and whistles that they've tacked on to justify that $1,200 and even sometimes $1,400 price point, this is the phone that you should be spending your money on. Now, personally, I think the Galaxy S21 offers the best bang for your buck at $800 compared to the other Galaxy S21 devices this year. And compared to what Samsung was trying to sell us last year, it's definitely a steal. So let's go over the basics here. You get a 6.2 inch display up front with a 10 megapixel selfie camera that's peeking through right up top, eight gigabytes of RAM on the inside, 128 gigabytes of storage, a Snapdragon 888 processor, just like the S21 Ultra, and then a 4,000 milliamp hour battery. It also has a triple camera system on the back that's pretty similar to what we saw last year with two 12 megapixel sensors for the standard and the ultra wide cameras, and then a 64 megapixel 3X zoom camera. Overall, it's a pretty respectable spec sheet, if not too flashy, of course. So why choose the S21 over a device like the S21 Plus? Well, for starters, there's that $200 price difference with Without any discounts or any promotions, the S21 Plus is gonna cost you $1,000. And it really doesn't deliver anything more than this device does besides a slightly larger display and a 4,800 milliamp hour battery. Everything else is exactly the same. Okay, maybe not everything. The other key difference between the S21 and the Plus is the plastic back panel that's on the back of this phone as opposed to the glass one that's on the Plus. Glass is definitely a premium product and should cost a little bit more, of course, but I don't think that those three specific upgrades really justify the $200 price difference between those phones, especially since Samsung's done an incredible job with the plastic finish on the back of this phone. Honestly, I really love it. As I pointed out in my S21 Ultra review, I think the design of these phones is absolutely stunning. And I think it even looks better on the S21 with the smaller camera module that's been pushed to the top left-hand corner on the back of the phone. The way it seamlessly melts into the metal frame makes it my favorite looking smartphone that I've seen in years. And honestly, I really love it. With so many other smartphones that are sporting the same identical design, the S21 really stands out in a crowd. And for me, that's a good thing. The size of the phone is really good as well. And that's thanks to the 6.2 inch display. And honestly, it's one of the changes that I appreciate the most. The fact that Samsung's done away with the curved panel. It's really hard to describe how much easier it is to use this phone in everyday use, not having that curved edge on the sides of the display. Of course, some are gonna be griping about Samsung simply cheaping out and trying to cut curves in order to save a little bit of cash, but that curved display really never served any true purpose here. That being said, I am disappointed with the resolution of full HD+. The last time that we had this resolution on a flagship smartphone from Samsung was in 2014, way back with the launch of the Galaxy S5. Nobody likes a downgrade, but let me be clear, the AMOLED display that they're using on this phone is still incredibly good with HDR10 plus support, 1300 nits of peak brightness, which means you can use this in direct sunlight 
pretty much any day. It doesn't matter how bright it is outside, you'll still be able to see the display. And then it has, of course, that 120 hertz refresh rate, just like last year's phone. But of course, since you don't have to choose between the higher refresh rate and also the higher resolution, you're gonna have that all the time when you turn it on in the settings. Now, personally, I love high resolution displays, but at 6.2 inches, it's still incredibly hard to notice individual pixels on the smartphone. So even though it is a downgrade, it's not one that most people are gonna notice unless they really, really look for it. One thing that I'd like to point out is that performance on the cheapest S21 device is practically identical to that of the most expensive one, the S21 Ultra, even though this phone here costs $400 more. And in some instances, the S21 fares even better simply because it's pushing around fewer pixels on the display. It does have one slight disadvantage though, and that's with multitasking, only having eight gigabytes on the inside versus 12 inside the Ultra. But you'll have really a hard time noticing that difference unless you're really, really looking for it. Gaming on this phone is spectacular as well with the Snapdragon 888 really delivering class leading graphics rendering here. Honestly, it doesn't matter what you're playing on this phone, it can almost always max out the frame rates that those games are really created to deliver. And there's really enough headroom for this processor to go even further for the next couple years as developers create even more graphic intensive games. This phone definitely will be able to keep up with them. And that brings us to the cameras on the back of the Galaxy S21. Now, compared to what the Galaxy S21 Ultra has to offer with its quad camera system, the three cameras on the back of this phone may sound a little pedestrian, but the good news is that Samsung really isn't phoning it in, despite the fact that they're using the same hardware as we saw on last year's S20. The image quality that the cameras deliver is superb with improved dynamic range, toning down saturation, something that Samsung's phones have always done a little bit too much of. And I honestly have no real complaints looking at the images from the back of this phone. And they're pretty consistent across the board with the standard ultra wide and the zoom as well. Now, I've always been a fan of Google's Pixel devices, mainly because of their cameras, but honestly, I might actually be switching over to Samsung's device once this review is over. And that's something that I haven't really done in quite a long time. The versatility of having an ultra wide main and 3X telephoto camera is the sweet spot. Honestly, I think I'm just happy that Samsung didn't throw in a macro camera on the back of the phone as well to boost the specs since I can't really remember the last time that I took a macro shot that wasn't for a smartphone review. The 3X zoom camera also does come in handy quite a bit when you're trying to get in closer to your subject without having to move physically closer to it. And now it may not be as impressive as the 10X zoom camera that's on the S21 Ultra, but that's definitely fine with me. The only downside is the front facing camera on this device with the results that are pretty good in most situations, but the 10 megapixel sensor paired with Samsung's image processing still isn't enough to compete with some other flagship devices that are on the market, especially Google's Pixel 5. In addition to great pictures, the S21 is also really good at video captures with all sensors, including the selfie camera, delivering 4K video at 60 frames per second. And if you wanna test out 8K video as well, the main sensor has you covered on that front. If you've watched my S21 Ultra review, you probably already know that I'm not a huge fan of One UI 3.0. Look, it covers all of the basics. And if you like customizing 1,001 different features, Samsung has you covered, it definitely does. But if you like things simple and clean, you're gonna have to install another launcher on this phone if you want that kind of experience. I will give Samsung credit for finally offering the Google Discover feed to the left of the main home screen, something that I've been looking forward to for a very, very long time. And honestly, I still can't believe that it's here. But my main issue with Samsung software comes down mainly to their aesthetics and their choices with the design with a side scrolling app drawer, which come on, I, who really wants that? And the inconsistency is in the layout for their stock applications. And also the fact that you have to deal with ads in things like the weather app, something that you really shouldn't have to see when you're paying $800 for a smartphone. On the battery front, the Galaxy S21 isn't gonna be winning any awards, but 
The 4,000 milliamp hour cell does the job quite well. On the average day, I was able to push the phone pretty hard for five to six hours of screen time, sending emails, browsing the web, playing games, taking pictures, and a whole lot more. And usually I finished out the day with about a 20% charge remaining after having it off of the charger for roughly 14 hours. Of course, you get wireless charging on the inside here and reverse wireless charging as well. If you're feeling generous and wanna share some of that precious power with a friend to top off their device or even charge your earbuds. One last thing that I'd like to mention about the battery is that Samsung is one of the only manufacturers that allows you to manually change the charging speed of the device. Now it's gonna max out still at 25 watts fast charging if you want a quick charge to the phone, but you are able to step things down and it's something that I definitely recommend doing if you charge your phone overnight since it reduces the degradation of the battery cell that you typically get with charging a phone faster. And if you're one of the millions and millions of people who buys a smartphone and holds it for more than a year, this is something you'll definitely wanna consider. I think we can all agree that the Galaxy S21 is an odd device. That being said, in my books, it still deserves a seat at the table among other flagship devices that we're gonna see in 2021. Its performance is incredible, the cameras are really good, and honestly, I really, really love the display on this phone. The main issue that most people are gonna have with this device, honestly, it comes down to the plastic panel on the back of the phone. And for me, it's not really an issue since most people are gonna slap a case on this phone anyways. And if it's the one reason why Samsung was able to sell this phone for $800, I think that's a good thing. The S21 may not be the ultimate flagship smartphone, but it's definitely the smartphone that I'm gonna be recommending for the average consumer who wants a really good camera system and honestly, enough performance to deliver an incredibly smooth Android experience for years to come. And that's gonna do it. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you wanna see my additional coverage of the S21 with my camera comparisons, check those out on my channel and subscribe as well. I have quite a few upcoming smartphone reviews so make sure you stay tuned for those. Thanks again, and I'll catch you in the next one.